Ben Habib. Hello, Ben. Good evening. Uh, what do you feel about Mr. Barnier's, Monsieur Barnier's uh, ultimatum? We have 48 hours uh, to buckle on our insistence that our sovereign waters are our own or he walks out of the talks or he won't come here to finish the deal. It'll be off. What do you think? Well, I'm delighted. I, I, I'm absolutely <laughs> delighted he set this ultimatum. And I hope, you know, I hope he walks because we've set that ultimatum a few times and we've failed to do it. And I, I hope he actually does it. And we get a no deal, which is the best deal, in my opinion, for the United Kingdom. I mean, as I understand it, uh, this is obviously he's French, but he's representing the whole of the European Union. <laughs> but this is on the back of uh, Macron, Emmanuel Macron's insistence yeah. that uh, the French must be allowed into our waters to fish uh, as w when and as how they like, that, that, that we have no control yeah. over foreign trawlers coming into our seas to fish. Now, we're not going to ban them. We just demand or reserve the right to call the shots. You come into our waters Absolutely. on our terms. Why is Barnier Absolutely. saying we can't do that? Well, it's the most extraordinary state of affairs. It's a bit like us saying, you know, we're going to go to France and we're going to start, you know... Yeah, uh, taking uh, their grapes. Plowing, uh, plow, yeah, taking their grapes, plowing their yeah. fields, going to Germany, manufacturing cars <laughs> unilaterally in their yeah. factories. Yes. You know, I mean, it's just an absolutely absurd proposition that we shouldn't have control of our waters. And it's because they're spoiled. You know, they've had it for 40 years. Ours are the best waters around the European, uh, around the coast of Europe. They want access to them. And they know, unlike the Remain contingent in the UK who keep talking down fishing, they know that actually fishing is a really important component of their coastal communities. It's not just about the fish you catch. It's about all the industry it generates around it. It's about the general well-being of areas that would otherwise have absolutely nothing to do. And we know that because our 186 coastal communities have been left, you know, largely destitute. Mm. So they know the value of our fishing. And even if we don't appreciate it, actually, because they're so insistent on it, we must be equally entrenched and refuse to hand it over. I mean, it seems to me um, a perfect storm in a negotiation, but one which almost of its own volition points you in the right direction. You know, the UK must not give ground. If they want it so damn badly, do not give it to them. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, uh, we were told uh, that uh, there was a possibility there could be some sort of deal by Tuesday. Last time I looked, it's Thursday. Uh, this is not going all according to plan. Is this a move by Barnier, do you think, uh, to at least... Uh, exit as if he had the he was the strong guy he was the guy with the upper hand uh, or is this another of the EU's ludicrous last minute ploys well it, th there is absolutely no doubt that the EU is now raking the United Kingdom over the coals you have to go back to how this all started you know the prime minister contrary to all the protestations he now might make signed us into a deal pursuant to which we promised to enter into a level playing field, give them fixed fishing quotas, give the ECJ special uh, hegemony over UK courts, and indeed commit our military to research and industrial innovation and interoperability and a whole load of other things. That is the deal the prime minister signed. And then he reneged on it. He actually told the EU, notwithstanding the fact I've signed that, I'm going to back off it. And guess what? If you don't give me the kind of deal I want by 31st December, we're not extending the transition period, we're leaving. And in fact, let's make that 30th June. If I haven't got what I think looks like the semblance of a good deal by 30th June, I'm gonna leave the negotiating table. Mm -hmm. And the EU sat there patiently and Barnier just kept picking up the political declaration and flashing it around, well saying, actually, this is what you promised. You know, and hey, presto, 30th June comes around, we don't walk. End of July comes around, which is the new uh, deadline that the Prime Minister set. Again, we don't walk. 15th October comes around, and we were meant to walk then if we hadn't got what we wanted on our red lines, and we don't walk. No. We still don't have our red lines. We don't have them agreed by the EU. And now it's the EU, for the first time, threatening to walk. And I really hope they do. <laughs> I hope that the Prime Minister isn't allowed to buckle, 
because I fear that a bad deal is much, much worse than anything that no deal could bring. No deal for me, by the way, I think is an absolutely perfect position for the United Kingdom. It's not as good as a free I've... trade, is it? It's not as good as a free trade deal with the EU. Well, <laughs> I think it's better, actually. Do you really want free trade with an entity which subsidizes its major exporter with a subdued currency? You know, the reason we run such a ra- large trade deficit with the European Union is effectively because the euro is far too cheap for Germany. And that's bleeding the UK dry over a period of time. We have to stand up. That's their state aid, effectively, their state aid laws being ignored by Germany because they've got this artificially weak euro. We've got to call them out on it. And if we have a free trade agreement with them, that effectively neuters our ability to do it. We can't do it. We've got to stand on our own two feet. We've got to grow a pair, as people Mm. might say. (laughs) And we've got to say enough is enough. But we haven't done it. We threatened to do it. We've repeatedly failed to do it. And now Barnier is doing it for us. And now no deal and would mean... music. Would no deal now mean they don't get any access at all, not even, you know, friendly access? They'd get nothing if it's no deal. They wouldn't well, be allowed. Well, that, that, I mean, that's the would, irony, they, isn't it, yeah, Ben? They get nothing. The, the yeah. irony, uh, Ben, is that... Uh, if uh, Michel Barnier uh, sticks to his hardline stance and storms out and the negotiations are over and there's no deal, then uh, the French don't get any access to our waters anyway. I uh, know. Now, I know. Uh, European Commissioner, uh, Commission Chief uh, Ursula von der Leyen uh, is making uh, bleak noises now. She's saying uh, a no deal could definitely be an outcome. So you're getting uh, very uh, downbeat uh, s- signals from her. But uh, let's talk about the EU generally. I think that the coronavirus crisis has diminished the EU in stature to an extraordinary extent. It has been worse than useless to its members throughout this yeah. crisis, hasn't it? And I think many, uh, more, any more, many more countries are looking at it and saying, what's the point? Absolutely. I mean, they have utterly failed their member states through the coronavirus crisis. They stuck to initially they stuck to their ideology on freedom of movement, refusing to allow member states to shut their borders, which was, you know, commonsensical thing for them to do at the point. And and then all the states did anyway. (laughs) And and, and the states did anyway. And then they refused to hand out grants and support schemes, which any sovereign state would have been able to do if it had its own currency. It all comes back to this wretched euro and the ECB. So now what you've got is a situation where you've got massively indebted southern rim states. You've got big contributors to the to the pot, which are Germany, Netherlands, used to be the UK. Thankfully, we are going to be out of that at least. Um, you know, and you've got this complete imbalance in that relationship. So the whole ship is creaking under the pressure of the coronavirus. And when I was there, you know, when I was an MEP, we were debating 1.1 trillion uh, euros being a massive budget for the seven-year multi-annual financial framework. Well, now it's 1.85 trillion because mm. they're having to accommodate all the pain that these southern rim countries have taken on in the last few months. But what's really amusing, I'm digressing, but it's really amusing, and I hope your, your listeners will want to hear this. They threatened Poland and Hungary with a lack of disbursement of funds unless they did what they wanted under what they regard as law and order. And Poland and Hungary just say, well, you know, off you go, buddies. We're not doing that. And Poland and Hungary showed more backbone than our prime minister has in the last nine months. And they're getting weaker, aren't aren't they? The EU are getting weaker. So we're getting stronger as the negotiations are getting delayed. Oh, absolutely. We are in a... The pandemic, at the risk of sounding... um, and I don't wish to sound in any way unsympathetic to the suffering that we've had through the pandemic. Actually, it strengthened our negotiating hand with the EU no end, because all of a sudden, actually, the need to be able to do what the government has to for the British people can only be fulfilled if we're not hamstrung by the regulations that we've seen have hamstrung the European member states. We've got to be able to give aid where we need it. We've got to be able to deregulate where we need it. We've got to be able to pump in money where we need it. You know, and all of that's been revealed now in yeah. Europe. And actually, that should, uh, Boris Johnson should be hugely emboldened by what he's seen across the channel in the last few months. Well, he, should be, he should be taking great confidence 
from a no deal outcome. But the, here's what worries me about Boris Johnson. Uh, you know, through this crisis, he has proved to have the backbone of a jellyfish. Your Brexit mm. Party MEP colleague, former colleague, uh, Alex Phillips was on the other day and she said that she feared that in the grand Johnson tradition, he would buckle at the last minute. Uh, given that this man, uh, as I say, has the backbone of a jellyfish, uh, I fear that he might buckle. Do you? I, I think he is going to buckle. I think it's a dead cert. Um, he either buckles or extends the transition period. Well, I mean, that's both buckling. Both of those are buckling. He will buckle. Uh, he's proven repeatedly he hasn't got the courage for no deal. And, you know, having set his own deadlines, having failed to meet them, he's pulled the rug out from under his own feet. And that's why Barnier has been so supremely self-confident over the last couple of months and feels able to make this threat. And actually, if the United Kingdom were one fifth the country it was 50, 60 years ago, we would now just say sod off. We would not go back to the negotiating table. It's high time we left. We're, we're the fifth largest economy in the world. We're a permanent member of the UN Security Council. We are a powerful nation. We have the 10th most powerful military in the world. And we should just stand tall and we should we should live under our own steam I and mean, we can do it. As the Prime Minister has often said, we can do it mightily. We'll be a mighty nation outside the European Union. And he's got to believe his own rhetoric and just do it. Yeah. Yeah, well, he believes he's like Winston Churchill, so uh, he'll, he'll believe anything. I don't want to get too romantic about this, Ben, but uh, yeah. I think that the fishing rights issue is crucial uh, because the fishermen of this country 50 years ago were sold down the river by Ed, Edward Heath. Uh, yeah. And it's about time this nation stood by them. I know that uh, it's not a massive part of our uh, industry in this country. It's a, a used to be, didn't it? Yeah. yeah but the point is uh, that that industry, those people who fish our seas from our country, uh, we've got to stand by them this time, haven't we? We have to. And don't underestimate the economic benefit that we would get from getting our fish back. I remember as a child going to Hastings and being delighted by the prospect of the trip, getting rock, um, mm -hmm. going down the piers, having a good time. And it was a vibrant, brilliant holiday destination. Now you would avoid Hastings <laughs> as much as you possibly could. I have got no... no it's getting better though, apparently, no, in Hastings. It's, but no insult intended on the no. people of Hastings. It's but just a battle to get wrong. there, isn't it? <laughs> It it's actually, a battle to yeah. get there. It the is. train journey is horrendous. <laughs> but, you know, we've had, we've had 40 years of them not having a living. We've had 40 years of the industry that surrounds fishing being decimated. We've had 40 years of all the ancillary hospitality businesses being absolutely put on the, under the jackboot of the European Union. And if we were to get that money back, it may be small by comparison to what the city earns, but it would be a very, very meaningful amount of economic growth for those communities. There are 186 coastal constituencies. The MPs for those constituencies should be hopping up and down, making sure they get those fish back. So their own constituencies by Boris Johnson, by Boris Johnson's promise are leveled up. It doesn't take a lot of money to do it. It takes a bit of foresight, a bit of investment and standing firm to mm. get our fishing waters back. Yeah. So Barnier uh, says that he may or may, well, he's actually saying uh, that unless we buckle, he won't come this weekend. But let's uh, assume that uh, in the grand tradition of him saying something and not doing it, he does turn up. Uh, do you predict uh, that they'll just kick the can down the road again and just say, well, we haven't actually reached an agreement, but there's still time? Well, they might try and fudge it. I mean, my fear is that they brush it under the carpet by agreeing a number of minor deals, which gets us past 31st uh, December. And they leave the big questions unanswered in the hope that they can, you know, get them resolved probably in the EU's favor when the media's sort of attention isn't on them. I, I think that's a difficult one. I think it's difficult for the European Union to do that. I, I don't think they'll want to give us any concession. They won't want to do anything that takes the pressure off the prime minister, because for them, this isn't an economic issue. This is an ideological one. Mm. The United yeah. Kingdom has to be punished for having the temerity yeah. to wish to leave. Yeah. And so having been faced with all the bluster and gung ho rhetoric, 
from Boris Johnson. They are now going to met it out to him. Mm -hmm. And the way they'll met it out to him is to give him one of two options. Either sign up to the political terms of the political declaration he signed back in uh, uh, January this year, or do something he promised he would never do, which is extend the transition period. And they're going to they're going to take him to the wire. And I imagine tonight Boris Johnson is holding his head in his hands thinking, what kind of PR spin can I put on this to get myself out of this corner? So so to sort of summarize, uh, despite our high hopes, no sort of real conclusion this weekend. It will be uh, put off yet again. Yeah, it certainly won't be brought to a conclusion by the United Kingdom. No. The EU may just walk. I'd take, I would, by the way, I would take Barnier's threat quite seriously. Okay, that's I think interesting. It's the, yeah, I think it's the first time they've made a threat with a very sharp time frame. This is not we'll walk on the 15th of December. This is we will walk in two days. Yeah. And I don't think he would have made that threat unless he had the backing of both Merkel and Macron. And, I, and therefore, it's a serious threat. And mm. having made it, it's not so easy to reverse it. So, you know, I'd watch this space quite carefully. The one thing I would say, Ben, like finally, uh, that does give me some confidence, Boris Johnson gives me no confidence whatsoever, mm. uh, which I find very disappointing, but that's the fact. He of did the it matter. first, didn't he? Yeah, right, well, but, well yeah. I, I had high hopes for him. So yeah, yeah. lots of people, yeah. but they have all dissipated, yeah. trust me. Yeah. Uh, but I do admire David Frost, our negotiator. Uh, I think he might be quite hard line. He might be our last hope, would you say? I hope so. But, you know, ultimately he takes his instructions from number 10. So mm. he's only as strong as number 10 will allow him. But I'll tell you where my confidence is. It's not in Boris Johnson. It's not in our UK negotiating team. My confidence lies with the British people. We're an extraordinary nation. You think what we've been through this year, and yet we keep going forward. We don't have revolutions. We don't have the kind of demonstrations that the French do, the gilets jaunes. So we just keep our noses to the grindstone and we keep moving forward. We keep chugging, no matter what the political class chucks at us, we just keep moving forward. So I think if we get a no deal, even though the government is hopelessly ready for it, they could, they're, they're not ready to take advantage of all the opportunities no deal offers, the British people will see us through. Whatever happens, the British people will see we us do through. Have, we do have revolutions sometimes, occasionally. Yeah, well, yeah. It was well, a long, I, long time ago. I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what, Ben. Did you want? I'll tell you what, Ben. I think there might be a revolution <laughs> fairly yeah. soon if they carry on locking us down all the time. But let's finish on your upbeat note. Uh, let's trust the British people. And let's just hope that this government can, at long last, fulfil the will of the population of this country, which is to leave the EU. Let's just hope we get that done. Uh, ben Habib, yeah. fa ben Habib, thank you so much for your time. Thanks, ben. As always, co-founder of Unlocked and former Brexit Party MEP Ben Habib. There, he's Ash. I'm Kev. This is the home of common sense and free speech talk radio.